Okay, everyone, thank you for coming back for part two of Inside Leather History of Fireside Chats. And again, I'm going to start right at the beginning with my next guest. Please tell us a bit about your family and growing up, because coincidentally, you live within just walking distance of where you were born. Yeah, I, I have the, uh, the, the pleasure of, of being able to say that I was born on Church Street. And... Uh, Church in Wellesley being in, in Toronto, one of the, the sort of the, the center of traditional uh, LGBT community here. So, yes, I was born uh, in 1959 in uh, Grace Hospital, and uh, I moved around a lot growing up and uh, settled back here in 1980, uh, and uh, I've lived here ever since. Well, where were some of the places that you lived growing up? Um, Montreal and uh, a town in Connecticut and uh, Brussels in Belgium. And why were you moving around so much? Uh, my dad. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he moved around a lot in terms of his work and, uh, and we followed. Okay. Well, very early on in life, you mentioned that your parents had taught you an interesting approach. What was that? Well, I think that one of the things that I uh, have a, learned to really appreciate, I, I think we all go through this process of, of uh, attachment to parents, and then we go through this period, usually during our teenage years, sometimes it lasts longer, where there's uh, Disharmony, for lack of a better word, and uh, we're all trying to find ourselves. Um, the thing that my parents taught me was that I was responsible for my own actions. And so how that translated was that everything good that happened to you was because of something you did. And everything bad that happened to you was because of something that you did. Uh, so that actually sounds like a disadvantage, um, and it is, um, because it really creates a sense of uh, responsibility, of course, but, but also for things that, that we may not have any responsibility for, but just life happens, and uh, bad things happen, and it's not necessarily because of something we did. But um, one, of my, uh, one of my core strengths is, is positivity and optimism and maximizing whatever situation I'm in. And so what I took from that was when I started to um, deal with being HIV positive, uh, I was infected in 1984, and uh, it was indispensable to me in terms of taking responsibility for my own health at a time when it was just crazy. I mean, nobody really knew what was going on, and and there was a lot of fear, and um, I had AIDS by 1990, and I was told I had two years to live, and and the only thing that was offered to me was high dose AZT, and a lot of my friends were dying from the AZT, so I I didn't get on that train. I, I decided not to, and but then I I didn't know where to go or what to do or what the map was. I had to create it for myself. And uh, it was in the process of doing a lot of volunteer work in the community, initially with AIDS Community of Toronto, where I had this opportunity to contribute to programming around health promotion and, and develop programming. And one of the programs I developed was something called HIV AIDS, A Spiritual Journey. And um, there was a lot of opposition to that idea because it sounded like this kind of like, I don't know, pouring pink paint over something that was traumatic for many people, including me. But what I found in that circle of those men were other men who had come to a place where they understood that they were living with this thing, um, they couldn't change the fact, um, what, what, could they, what could that inform in their lives? How could that be a teacher for them? And, uh, and I learned a tremendous amount from those circles and from those men. And uh, gradually over time, I figured out, you know, I made my map and, and uh, 
bit by bit. I followed it and um, I um, stuck around. I was able to live through, recover from the AIDS and, and, and stick around long enough um, after 19 years to go on um, antiretrovirals and the sort of fourth and fifth generation drugs, which have been very successful for me. But on a slightly lighter note, when you were very young, a blue beach ball factored into your fantasies. Would you please explain that? <laughs> yeah, I know, I, he liked this story. I, I'm not sure exactly why. Um, well, so the, this, is a, this is a question that Douglas asked about, you know, what, like, you know, what's your first kinky memory, you know? Or, and uh, I don't know, you know, for me it wasn't like getting tied up at a tree or tying someone up at a tree or, I just, I don't know, you know, I just, I, I love bondage and I love, uh, I love rubber and I love the sense of being encased in second skin, whether it's rubber or leather. I like my leather tight. Um, anyway, I, so for years, you know, I think, I think, I, who knows what dreams mean, actually, but I think that dreams that I have on a recurring basis are important somehow. And this was a dream that I had intermittently over about three years, I guess, from sort of age five. So, uh, and the dream was that I was, I was floating through, I was like this child of the cosmos. I was like floating through the galaxy um, and um, no particular gender, actually. I mean, it was just, just this sort of, I don't know, because uh, I, I, I had no, pubes, I didn't have any hair, I was just, anyway, but I was, I was lying, I was lying, and I was, and I was floating, and I was completely covered, like as if I had been dipped in this blue plastic um, with glitter in it, uh, <laughs> and that was a, my favorite beach ball at the time, was this blue ball with, I think it was gold glitter in it, so that's the story. <laughs> Well, how did you learn a about the uh, leather world? Please tell us about coming out into the leather community. Well, this surprises me to this day, but I actually found copies of Drummer in a uh, dirty section of a smoke shop on Princess Street in Kingston in the late 70s. Um, so I was, at the time I was uh, at university at, at Queens in Kingston and, um, you know, uh, I, was, I was always on the lookout for the most extreme that I could find. And I, I was amazed at this, this world. The drummer was this world for me uh, that, that I had no other knowledge of. And, and I had never, I'd never seen before. I never, it was just, and, and I would get the, I would, there was like, I think they had three or four copies over like, three-year period, like, I, I would go back and you never know if they would have one or not, and, and I was afraid to ask um, when they would be getting another one, and so, uh, uh, and you know, so I get it in the brown paper bag and I couldn't wait to get home. And of course there were the pictorials and there was the editorial, but in those days it was, the, the classifieds were, were, were in the magazine, you know, they weren't on the phone, they weren't, uh, remember phone lines, we had phone lines and then we, uh, then we went to, uh, to online. So uh, these ads for me, which didn't have pictures, um, but the words and, the, and the, the feelings and the gear, and the, I just, I remember jerking off to them over and over and over again. And uh, that was my introduction into leather, was drummer. What? sorts of ads were you reading? I mean, I can't even imagine what they must have been depicting to excite you so much. Well, you know, I, I, I wish I had actually, I could have brought some, because um, I, <laughs> I, I, I kept them. Uh, I, once did, I once did this talk on, um, on pig sex at a conference in Vancouver, and what I did was a, almost like a performance piece where I 
I read classifieds that I had selected and in a certain order. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll do that another time. Uh, well, no, I don't, I don't have them. I mean, I could make them up. We could all make them up. We could each do one. We could go around. Um, no, I, I, think that, I, I think that even then, um, I was always drawn to the stuff that was the most extreme. I, I mean, it was the, the things that were the most intense, the heaviest, the, that was what drew me. Um, so that's kind of where I started. I, I started with that. Well, yesterday, we had a bit of an opportunity to walk around the neighborhood, and you pointed out a number of places, some that are still existing and some that aren't, that were all part of the Toronto leather scene, the leather community. Please tell us about the Toronto scene you knew when you came into it. Well, uh, I arrived here in um, 1980. I had visited a couple of times before, but uh, I'd arrived in 1980. And uh, at that time, the, the culture was different in the sense that uh, there were no leather bars, per se, in the Church Wells area. Um, there was a bar called 18 East that some of you will remember. Anybody? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Good, 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 good. 18 East, 18 Eastern Avenue. Um, and that was, uh, I, I, I think by any stretch, certainly by today's standards, but definitely <laughs> by any stretch was really, uh, you know, a, a hardcore leather bar. That was definitely a leather bar. Um, but there wasn't anything um, in the Church Wellesley area and I think the culture was different. I, I think wherever, wherever I would go on, on occasion, there would be leather men. Um, and um, one of the places that I went to on occasion, I think a total of three times, it, just, it wasn't really a place that I was normally drawn to, but there were so many places. Um, some of you will remember that there were quite a few bars that, 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 had, that gay guys went to, uh, and, uh, and sometimes in leather. And I went to the Manatee. Does anybody know the Manatee? Yeah. Yeah. A few, okay, all right. So, so that's, a, that's a, a typical example of Toronto where the facade is still there <laughs> on St. Joseph Street, uh, but the rest of it is, is, a, is a condo. Um, so uh, the Manatee, so I went there once and then a few months passed. I went there a second time. And the second time I went there was really significant because I met this daddy and his boy. They were the only ones there in leather. And uh, I was scared, I was, I was intimidated, but I really wanted to meet them. So I did meet them. And conveniently, they lived across the street. <laughs> so, not, so what was significant was this is the first time that I, that I he became a mentor, the daddy became a mentor. Um, and uh, it was the first time that, that I had developed any kind of uh, relationship, friendship, um, outside of guys that I might hope to meet when I was cruising. Um, I, I didn't know anybody until I met them. So um, um, he, uh, he died several years later um, from AIDS, um, but I'm, um, you know, we talk about the importance of mentoring and, and, and just for me, even knowing, there was so much power in just knowing that there was this possibility of a loving relationship that was based in, in DS and in, in dominance and submission. So um, I think that that helped chart a course for me and that I've, I've always sought that in my relationships. Let's revisit mentoring a little bit more. You, you've alluded to it, but what does that mean? What does that, how does that benefit people in the community? Well, it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, you guys all know, it's, it's, it's fundamental. I mean, it, it is, it, it's actually the essence, I think, of, of community because um, we all uh, have, uh, we all have knowledge, you know, we all have, um, we all have something to offer the next person. And, and that's, that's how community builds, that's how community grows, that's how community, and, um, 
And we have to be the ones to reach out to the new ones. We have to be the ones to reach out to somebody standing in the back right now who doesn't feel like they're part of it. Um, and, and, and that's the way that people are welcomed and that's the way that people are brought in. And, and um, I, I grew up into leather in um, sort of, I guess, the tail end of what we call the old guard. But there's been so many, I've, I've, I've been part of so many conversations over the decades about old guard, new guard. I, I don't know which new guard we're at now, but it's several, it's several yeah. generations <laughs> from the yeah. old, old guard. Um, yeah. But I, I've always approached uh, that whole new old guard new thing with, um, you know, what what made sense to me, and not worry too much about where it came from. But uh, but that tradition is something that I'm I'm just so passionate about um, because that's how I learned. Um, you know, I mean, having having someone like Guy Baldwin as a mentor is you know amazing. Yeah. Um, and and we're all that for somebody else. And um, and I think that. What I've tried to do with um, with my boys or um, uh, or my my current slave um, is is really the contract is part of the contract is okay I'm going to share everything that I know as much as I can with you but the deal is you have to pass it on and that's I'm I'm very explicit about that up front um, because I think that. Uh, there is nothing that can uh, replace the the nuances and the, the conversations and the, the the personal connections that Absolutely. we establish with each other. And it's not just about it's not just about <coughs> access to good information. We can we can access good information. Sometimes we have to search for a little bit online, and you know we all know that not all the information online is good. But we can get good information. What we can't get is is the human connection is the heart connection is the soul connection yeah. that happens and that for me is really the basis of all of this a few minutes ago you brought up having lived with HIV for more than 30 years and that you had a unique approach to that tell us about the early days of HIV what did you choose to do about it when you were confronted with this well, I think the, the most important thing uh, that drove everything that followed was deciding that I wasn't going to die from it. Um, and that sounds, you know, as I sit here and I say that, I mean, that sounds kind of, I don't know what, arrogant, sounds kind of presumptuous, sounds kind of, because I know people that did, you know, quote unquote, all the right things that I did, and they died and I didn't. So. Uh, but I just I just figured that if I if I was gonna if I'm if I'm around that means I'm supposed to continue to be of service so that part was easy to figure out but uh, I think um, I, I think that it became this inward journey I think that I had to figure out um, you know who I am what do I want to be how do I want to live my life and the things that I learned uh, along that journey were you know were indispensable I mean I was I was I was trying everything. Um, and uh, because it turns out that there are there, there are other ways of looking at, at health. There's I relied a lot on traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I didn't go on pharmaceutical medication for 19 years. Wow. Uh, and um, I recovered from AIDS. So um, I was I was it was a very creative process, but it was also part of the journey journey of, of mastery. You know, it was about um, it was about um, taking charge of my life and figuring out what did I need to do for me. And in this case, it meant firing the doctor that I had because he wasn't on board with this. He was too afraid that if I didn't, you know, all he had was the twelve hundred milligrams of AZT. Yeah. And if, and he had nothing else to offer me. So if I wasn't taking that, then then he was really scared for me. And so anyway. Eventually, I found um, I found uh, practitioners and and assembled a team and you know so much privilege that we have in this country and and uh, in this city in terms of supports and and uh, those other men that I was telling you about 
and women as well, um, who had been living with it for a long time also and had, 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 had figured out some things. And we all kind of learned from each other. You helped to resurrect the Mr. Leather Toronto contest. Please tell us how that happened. <laughs> well, I was actually, I was working on a book at the time um, with a, an indigenous woman. Uh, we were traveling the province and we were talking to people. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna switch and not talk about HIV anymore in a second, uh, but it's been kind of a big part of my life. Anyway, so we were collecting stories, and we, the stories that we were collecting of men and women living in Ontario, uh, living with HIV for a long time, and again, it's back to this idea that these were individuals who identified this experience for them had become a spiritual experience. And uh, fascinating people, fascinating people. So doing this project, and um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jay Wagner uh, had, uh, I don't know. There was some, there was some politics involved. I imagine we we were joking yesterday that there's no no politics in yeah. our community, but but apparently Who knew? apparently there was some politics. I, I don't know what the politics were exactly, but um, so uh, Les might know. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, somehow Jay had this, this this guy Jay Wagner had gotten rights to the Mr. Leatherman Toronto uh, title, which was the original title and uh, was, was putting on a contest, uh, which was in the fall of uh, 1995 for the 1996 title year. And uh, it was about getting the title back, uh, back happening in the community, back, back having a representative um, from the city at IML, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I guess, I don't know. I mean, it was really kind of like beating the bushes, trying to get, it, no, some things haven't changed. Uh, try and get uh, guys to come forward, and um, and and uh, I think he had a, I think he had a couple of people at, at the point where he approached me, and I said, well, you know, I'm working on this book, like I, I, you know, this is not a good time for me. I mean, maybe a year from now, you know, I don't know. I haven't really given it a lot of thought, but right now I need to focus on this book, or it's it's just not going to get done. And because um, I, I I knew that if if if, if I took it. Um, and, and, I, and I was going to compete. I was going to try and compete to win. And, and if I won, then I was going to have to do a good job. And uh, so I figured it was going to take up a lot of time. Sure. Um, uh, and it always takes up more time than we imagine it's going to take. So anyway, so I said no. And he came back to me. Uh, I guess this was like the week before. And he said, um, I really need you to run because I don't, I don't know. We don't have a great contest. And, so I said yes, and, um, and then the rest is history. Tell us a bit about that history. What, what did you do with your title year? Can't just drop that bomb. <laughs> well, um, so uh, there was no infrastructure, really. Um, uh, the, uh, back, back in the day, so, so I, had a, I had a leather bar vest, and so back in the day, uh, you, you, you know, took your took my vest into George at Northbound, and uh, and he and you know he put some studs in the back of my vest, um, and uh, no no colors, no patches, nothing fancy. It was my vest. I didn't even get a vest. That was how that, that's a low budget. No, it was wow. really low budget in those days. So uh, and and they got the title wrong. I should have brought my vest. Um, sure. So uh, the title actually says uh, Mr. Toronto Lebanon. Uh, but we didn't change it. So, uh, so I started off, I was sponsored by the Black Eagle. The Black Eagle was amazing to me. Um, they gave me all kinds of um, VIP privileges. And one of the things that, um, one of the things that, that I, uh, I'm proud of actually is, is in doing the fundraisers, because we all, we all have to do those fundraiser things. Um, I had a guest list. And uh, so this is back in 1996, so I had a guest list. And what I started doing was inviting leather dykes that I knew and putting them on my guest list. And this was at a time when women were not allowed in the Black Eagle. Oh, wow. So, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that started something. Um, and uh, it was a little radical at the time. 
and uh, there were a lot of leather guys that weren't very happy about it. Um, but you know, uh, it was it was something I could do, so I was happy to do that. And uh, I worked really hard. We um, that year uh, there were monies raised for something called the Triangle Program, which is a, a program for LGBT youth, the school program here in Toronto, and uh, for the um, Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Well, you've been involved in community development work for many, many years. Uh, please tell us about some of the new approaches, new programs that you're spearheading. Well, I, I've, had a, um, I've had a very long history with uh, the AIDS Committee of Toronto. AIDS Committee of Toronto is uh, the largest organization of its type in Canada, and, and it's known for doing innovative work and, and groundbreaking work. And um, that was a place for me that started back in the early 90s and doing these workshops and creating new programming as a volunteer. Um, but when I was hired um, into uh, doing frontline work and then later in management and then finally as a senior director, I was able to uh, initiate uh, new programs and new resources. And uh, um, the, I think that's one of the things that comes from you know, when you have a certain amount of power in any situation, you can you can use it. You can use it for good. You can use it for for not so good. I tried to use yeah. it for good. And uh, one of the things that um, I'm most proud of is uh, a program that uh, that I brought to ACT uh, last year, 2014, um, and uh, it was a trans men's um, group project. And so this was a program for trans men who identified as gay, and uh, the program was facilitated by trans men and developed by trans men. And um, what I did was bring it to the agency, hire the people, and, and they ran with it. So they developed the curriculum, they uh, ran a successful program as a pilot, and um, it's the first time it had been done, this program had been done anywhere in the world. Wow. So, uh, so that lives on, and, and there's a step-by-step -step process with these things, because then, then there's no more money. Uh, and, but you use those results uh, to, to, to as a leverage to get, to get more funding. It's always a, it's always a game of chasing funding for, for programming in, in community, as we know. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, uh, I coordinated a, 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 a production of a, of a new web resource. Um, it's called Shared Health Exchange, and uh, it's a it's a program about women and HIV, uh, or a web resource about women and, and HIV, and uh, and it's won a couple of awards, so I'm really proud of that. And uh, of course, uh, familiar to some of you would be the BDSM uh, Safer Kinky Sex resource, uh, which is a national resource that um, is developed here in Toronto and has a long history in terms of. Uh, it started off as a little, a little eight and a half by eleven folded piece of paper, and now it's a, a small booklet, and uh, it is the most. Uh, so that's a resource that I coordinate um, and edit, and uh, it uh, is the most requested resource of all of the publications that ACT uh, puts out. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really been awesome and. And and with our national partner, it's distributed nationally, and and uh, and uh, it's so cool. When I used to see the order forms that come in, and you know, it's a certain number from uh, you know 210 from Alberta, and you know 140 from Saskatchewan, and just right across the country. And um, I've lost track now whether this is the eighth edition. Wow. But anyway, there's wow. a new edition coming out in 2015. Fantastic. But if funding and logistics were not an issue, if they were unlimited to you, what would you like to accomplish with your programs? Well, you know, programs are, again, I just, I just, I'm in a position now where I can, uh, I can make things happen. Um, the programs are really driven by community, you know, so with the example of the trans men's group, um, the AIDS Community of Toronto was approached by that community to run this program. So the programs really come from community and I think that uh, the bottom line really would be if there were if there were more resources 
to be able to help people in, in more ways. There's a lot of gaps in, in, uh, in healthcare, uh, particularly around mental health. Um, um, and it's not, a, it's not about not having the research, it's, it's about not having the resources and not dedicating the resources. Uh, so I think that um, there's always an element of um, advocacy in, in, in the work that I do. Uh, and, uh, and the whole point of that is to try and meet people's needs better. Okay. What's the biggest misconception about you? I, I was talking to Dennis about a couple of your questions, uh, his partner Dennis. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the misconceptions are, if there are any. So I have no idea how to answer that. Okay. I, I don't know. We can we can take. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll field questions. I'll field comments. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> but I have no idea what they are. What do you think was your greatest accomplishment as a title holder? Well, I think uh, definitely. Uh, you know, it was a transition year, obviously, uh, and, and I think I'm. I think I'm proudest of of getting, you know, getting the title back back sort of on the map and. And uh, it uh, continued for many years thereafter, and um, I think it was really just about getting the the title back and the visibility. And and uh, I've always been I, I've always been wrapped up in in uh, oh, that's an interesting turn of phrase. Um, <laughs> I, I've always been uh, committed and involved in education work. So I think that um, I think that I I was able to help draw some more attention to, to some of that work as well. But it really was about getting the title back up and running. And if you could go back in time into your leather journey somewhere, is there anything you would like, you wish you could change or do better? I think, I think everything, no and yes is the short answer. Okay. I think everything, you know, we, we're always trying to do our best and I think that everything, it's always easy in hindsight to look back and say, well, you know, if I knew what I knew now, I would, you know. Um, I think that, uh, I think that I would not have been as intimidated. I think I would not have been as shy. I think I would not have held back. I think I would not have doubted uh, who I am and what I have to offer as much. I think I would have, all those times where uh, I, I hesitated, you know, where I, I had a chance to meet somebody and I, and I just, and I held back and I didn't, you know. Um, I think that's, I think that's what I would change. If, if, you know, if confidence comes with age and experience and wisdom and so, but yeah, just, to be more of, of who I am. Fantastic. And I thank you for a fantastic interview. You're welcome. Back on the clock, everyone.